Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give a hand for Jesus. A hand for Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. We worship you. King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I am very much at home here with you. Amen. I feel that the, the walls of this church include the ends of the earth. Amen. And that is what every church should do. The walls of every church must include the ends of the earth. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Sergio and, and your dear wife, Georgiana, and all of you here tonight. I'm blessed and honored to be in your midst. And uh, my team, as I speak, is uh, actually having a crusade in Africa. Um, I got the report already because they are a few hours ahead of us. I got the report back from tonight's meeting and they were totally washed out. It looked, I've seen the picture, it looked as if the evangelist was preaching in a car wash. But he preached. But he preached. So we really thank God for the privilege of, of, of preaching the gospel to the poor. I was on TV with a friend. And uh, here in America. And he suddenly said to me while we were live on the air. He said to me. Reinhardt, God has given to me America, and he has given to you Africa. I jumped up, I said, let's shake hands. It's a deal. <laughs> Only afterwards, I realized, wait a minute. God has given to him the rich. And to me, he has given the, I won't say. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about it. And shall I tell you what I believe? I believe I've got the better deal. <laughs> Hallelujah. Of all tongues and tribes and nations, people will stand before the throne of God. In the first 10 months, or rather, the first 10 years of this century, the last decade, we've been able to lead 55 million people to Jesus. 55 million! Hallelujah! 55 million less in hell. 55 million more in heaven. Hallelujah. No, oh, we are rejoicing. We are condemned to victory. We cannot lose because Jesus won already. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I don't say this to brag or anything. I always say when people say, oh, how, how do you do it? How did you do it? I said, I did it in the name of the one who has said, without me, you can do nothing. <laughs> Our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. I want him to have all the glory. He is the savior. We needed to be saved. I needed to be saved. We all need to be saved. As we will hear a little later. And what a joy. May, may I take the liberty to just tell you a little bit of my background. Do you want to hear something? I, I'm, I'm a German national. Uh, <clears throat> I was born uh, in Germany during World War II. So that's a long time ago. 
Somebody said to me, you are not old, you are antique. <laughs> but I disagree with that. Um, when I was a teenager, I grew up in West Germany. We became refugees, landed in West Germany. I grew up in the city of Hamburg. Later on, I lived in the city of Frankfurt. But I'm neither a Hamburger nor a Frankfurter. And when I was a teenager, 14, 15 years of age, one day I studied our family tree and to my surprise I discovered that my family was godless. They were godless. Except that my grandfather and my father stuck out as men of faith but put their trust in Jesus. So I said to my dad, I said, Dad, what happened? How did God break into the Bonky family? And what he said shook me and shaped me. This is the story. In 1922, my grandfather was very sick there in East Germany. Very agriculture it was, agricultural it was. Forests, lakes, farms. Very lonely. My grandfather was very sick. He had a form of rheumatism or something like that. The doctors couldn't diagnose. He was sensitive to touch. He was sensitive to movement. And every time he was touched or, it, or his body moved in the slightest way, he had excruciating pain and was screaming day and night. Week after week, month after month, year after year, there was no hope, there was no help, he didn't know Jesus, there was nothing. And one day, a miracle happened. An American missionary got lost in the forest <laughs> and came to our village. And I think... As was the custom in those days, the first thing when he arrived in our village was not to complain that he had lost his way. His first question was, is there anybody sick in this village? All the people said, for sure, here in the bonky house. That man, his name was Louis Graf, entered the house of my ancestors like a burning torch. He swept away the cobwebs of all godlessness and dead religion and said, I have come to demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit. He preached salvation to my grandfather writhing in pain. And then he stepped forward, got him by his hand. That moment the power of the Holy Spirit shot through my grandfather. He jumped out of bed Totally, completely healed. Yes. My grandmother and my grandfather got saved that day. I was born 18 years later. But I believe that that day when Louis Graf entered the house of my ancestors, the Holy Spirit put the thread through my needle. This is the providence of God. The providence of God. Later on when the Soviet army advanced and we had to run for our lives, crossing the Baltic Sea just to get away direction west. I was only four years of age. The ship before us that we just missed sunk. 11,000 people drowned. 
We got on the next ship and our ship was struck by a mine and it began to sink. It listed, it tilted. For decades afterwards in my dreams I heard the screams of the people. Suddenly the boat righted itself and the captain announced that the pumps were coping with the inflow of water. I know why that ship didn't sink. Because my needle was already threaded. We have an eternal purpose, an eternal purpose. And I pray that everybody's needle will be threaded by the Holy Spirit today, if it isn't yet. Say amen. Hallelujah. Now, this is how my autobiography starts. I'm sorry for this small book. But I have lived a long life. I'm 71 years of age. I took five chapters out to make this book thinner. <laughs> but you will be blessed. This is not just an ordinary autobiography just to, to keep record. This is dynamite. <laughs> it's dynamite. It starts with an explosion and it finishes with an earthquake. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. A pastor called me the other day. He said, Reinhard, I, I just, I, last week I received a call from one of my members. And that lady said, she, I must please pray for her. She suffers from insomnia. He asked her, now why can't you sleep? She said, it's the bonky book. Well, I was happy to hear that. I must confess, I was happy to hear that. Amen. I believe that this testimony will, 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 will shake you up. You know, some people like the church like ice cream. Cold but nice. We like it hot. We like it hot. They appeared to them divided tongues of fire and one sat upon each of them. I'm a hot preacher. <laughs> Hallelujah. I love to wear my blood red tie just to show the people my thermometer. <laughs> Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. Isn't that true? And before I forget, let me quickly tell you, I'm on Facebook. <laughs> Have I got some Facebook friends here? What? I love you. I love you. I've got 362,000 friends right now. My wife says, what are you doing there so early in the morning? I said, I said, honey, I'm busy with my home church. <laughs> Praise God. Every day I have something punchy from the word of God. It will bless you. If you look under evangelist Reinhard Bonke official page, you will find me there. And you will be blessed. I told the pastor yesterday, I, something like this I put on uh, my Facebook, something like this. The less Holy Spirit we have, the more cake and coffee we need to keep the church going. Well, I'm not against cake, I'm not against coffee, I like both. All I'm saying is, the Holy Spirit has no substitute. We need the Holy Spirit, you know, we need the Holy Spirit. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. 
We want to continue with the harvest of souls. I consider it a great honor to be an evangelist. I preach the ABC of the gospel. I also know the XYZ, don't you worry. <laughs> and although I preach the ABC, I write books about the XYZ. And that will that spread great, great blessings. It's true next week. You will have a soul winning seminar here, right here. I put my whole heart into those texts and the films. My whole heart, 10 years of my life, I put into those films, filming across the whole globe. You will be greatly blessed. And I pray that that anointing, that burning, may, may, just, may just jump over into everybody's Chris, Christian's heart. There's a great work for us to do. To rescue the perishing and to care for the dying. Amen? Yeah. Hell was not made for man. I'm not swearing when I say to hell with the devil and to heaven with the people. This is pure theology. This is what Jesus came to do. To save us. Hell was never made for man. Never. For the devil and his angels let them go there. But Jesus saves. Say amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Well, if I have an opportunity at the end of the meeting, I, I may autograph your book there at the foyer if I have a chance God bless you I love you all and uh, I'm now coming to the message that the Lord has laid upon my heart I'm an evangelist and I don't apologize for it no um, I'm going to read a scripture to you from which I believe the gospel can be preached clearest to my way of thinking the gospel comes out clearest and may everyone get a revelation of what the Holy Spirit had in mind when John wrote this chapter telling us about that adulterous woman I read I, I, please allow me to read the first the first uh, 11 verses John chapter 8 but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives now early in the morning he came again to, into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery and when they had set her in the midst they said to him teacher this woman was caught in adultery in the very act now Moses in the law here in the Bible commanded us that such should be stoned but what do you say this they said testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him but Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear so when they continued asking him he raised himself up and said to them he who is without sin among you throw a stone at her first and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one beginning with the oldest even to the last and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman he said to her woman where are those accusers of yours has no man condemned you she said no one Lord 
And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. All I want to walk. All I want to do here in the next few minutes is to walk you through this, through this story as it happened. The Pharisees and the scribes hated Jesus because he was more popular than him. There was a lot of jealousy. After all, we read that because of envy, they delivered him. Jesus to be crucified. Envy, jealousy played a very, very big role. And the Pharisees said, we are convinced this Jesus is not the Messiah. We are convinced he is an imposter. We are convinced his teaching is false. They based it on the following things. They based it on the fact that they had watched Jesus enter hand in hand the house of the biggest crook in Jericho, Mr. Zacchaeus. Hand in hand. They said if Jesus was the son of God, he would have smelled ten miles against the wind. That that man was a real big sinner, a crook. Yet he walked hand in hand and accepted the hospitality of that man. So he cannot be the Messiah. It's just wrong. Secondly, they said, we watched ourselves how he healed a man, a cripple on a Sabbath. And after the man was healed, he said to him, take your mattress on the Sabbath and go home. What if Jesus was the Messiah? He would respect the law of God. He would not cause anybody to break the Sabbath. Unbelievable. So for months they worked on a trap. And this was the trap. The trap was that they said when Jesus is in a big crowd of people, they will find somebody caught red-handed in the very act of adultery. And then they bring that person to Jesus and then they will say, the law of Moses in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 20, if you care to read it up. It says that if a man or a woman commits adultery, they must die for it. So then we will say, this is what the Bible says. This is what the law of Moses says. But what do you say? And then they said, Jesus can only say two things. He can say, you know that I am merciful. Why do you want to be so cruel? Let this woman go home. If Jesus would have said that, they would have said, people of Israel, you heard with your own ears that this Jesus speaks against the law of Moses, he must die. If Jesus would have said the opposite, if he would have said, yes, my dear Pharisees, you are perfectly right. Come on, boys, pick up the stones and give it to her. Then they would have said, even Jesus acknowledges that we are the keepers of the law. Now they had caught that woman already. It was early in the morning in Jerusalem. Jesus walking with his disciples to the precincts of the temple. The people asked him to teach them about the kingdom of God. He sat 
down and he taught them. Can you imagine how wonderful that must have been to hear the gospel straight from the mouth of Jesus? I wished I could have been a fly at the wall. And while Jesus was teaching and preaching in the stillness of that morning, suddenly a, a screaming a dust of cloud from the left side. And as that screaming crowd came closer, they could see these were the holy men in their holy robes, kicking a woman before her. She resisted, but she had no chance. Then one final kick, and that woman landed right on all fours at the feet of Jesus. And then he said, Teacher, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Moses says she must be stoned to death. What do you say? Now the moment had come. Jesus stood up and he said, He who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone at her. Now, that's my first point. That moment something happened then, 2000 years ago. What is happening now here, this very moment? Holy Spirit began to move. It was still ringing in every ear the word of Jesus. He who is without sin throw the first stone at her. Here stood the chief Pharisee with his long beard, his high-pitched voice ready to condemn Jesus. Suddenly he had an experience he had never had before. I know it from an eyewitness. I know it from the Holy Spirit. You know what happened? Suddenly the chief Pharisee had something he never had happened in his whole life. He had a vision. He had a vision. What did he see in that vision? He saw two tablets, two tables of stone. And on these two tablets of stone were the Ten Commandments engraved. He couldn't help but read commandment number one. And after he read commandment number one, something very eerie happened to him. A voice started to cry inside of him. It was the voice of the Holy Spirit. He cried only one word. Guilty. You are guilty. Oh, oh. He, he couldn't help but read commandment number two. The same voice. Guilty. Three, four, five. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Six, four, seven, eight, nine, ten. And every time. Guilty. He began to perspire. He looked left. He looked right because he thought his colleagues had heard that loud voice screaming inside of him, Guilty! Then that old Pharisee realized, if I throw the first stone at that woman, that stone, that stone will be like a football. It would hit her and then jump back and hit me too because I'm also guilty 
I'm guilty. I cannot cast. I cannot throw the first stone. What did that chief Pharisee do? I tell you what he did. He picked up his holy garment, put in the reverse gear, and then when nobody watched, he who is without sin throw the first stone. There was the second senior Pharisee. It was ringing in his ear just as well. He couldn't help it. The Holy Spirit touched him. What did he do? His mind went back just to last Wednesday. He saw himself in the chalet at the lake of Galilee committing the exact same sin he now accused this woman of he said oh I can't throw the first stone if I throw the first stone that stone will be like a boomerang it will kill that woman and then it will whistle back and come for me I'm guilty what did he do Picking up his holy garment, putting in reverse gear, and disappearing one after another. Oh my God. And the Bible says from the oldest to the youngest, all accusers disappeared. Disappeared. Now. I'm coming to a very important matter here. What about us here today? Is anyone here who has kept all the commandments of God from the first day of his life until now? The Bible says we are all sinners. The Bible also says, if someone says he's not a sin, sinner, he has not sinned, he's a liar. So I don't want to, I don't want anyone to tell me here he's not a sinner. Because I don't want to call you a liar. <laughs> no. We are all guilty. From the oldest to the youngest, we are all guilty oh my god we are all guilty before the son of the living god how was it that morning i like to ask you was was there anybody without sin yes or no, no. oh now you disappoint me there was one. Bless God, there was one without sin. His name, it was Jesus. 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 The Bible says of him, he who knew no sin was made sin for us. You know what? He who is without sin, throw the first stone. Jesus had the right to stoop down, pick up the first boulder, and throw it into the face of that woman. Throw it into the faces of all those hypocritical Pharisees. Into my face and into your face. Because we are all guilty. That is the first big lesson here. We are all guilty. Say amen. amen. Now, I'm coming.
coming to my next point. Let me turn for a moment to that woman. When the temple police arrested that woman, they grabbed her. She resisted. She looked into the eyes of those men. She said, I know you. And I think I know you too. <laughs> and I know you. You want to judge me? They said, you filthy mouth, today you will die. Forward. She resisted. And then she forcibly was taken to Jesus and to his congregation. As I said, one final kick and she landed on all four right at the feet of Jesus. Now, something amazing happened. I'll tell you what happened. When that woman was with her face in the, on the ground, right at the feet of Jesus, she looked up and for the split of a second, she could see the eyes of Jesus. She looked into the eyes of Jesus and Jesus looked for a split second into her eyes. That moment it was as if she was struck by lightning. Shall I tell you why? For the first time in her life, that woman looked into sinless eyes. She looked into sinless eyes. And suddenly it came over her. If anyone can judge me, it's this one. And whatever he judges, whatever he says, I will accept. I will gladly accept this judgment. Yes, I am a sinful woman. She heard the conversation between the chief Pharisee and Jesus. Moses says, this woman must be stoned to death. Teacher, Jesus, what do you say? That woman was so mixed up. She was so dissolved. She was so nervous. She did not hear the first part of the reply of Jesus. She did not hear when he said, He who is without sin among you, throw the first stone. She only heard, throw the first stone. She buried her head under her arms. She said, yes, I accept this verdict. I have deserved death. Please throw the stones quickly. I have deserved everyone. And when the stones didn't come, she looked up. And Jesus again looked at her. He said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? She looked around. She said, Lord, there's no one left. They've all gone. And then came, 
his word of salvation neither do I contempt you go in peace and sin no more say amen Here may be some people who may say, Monkey, this message is not for me. Some dear wives may say, I was faithful to my husband my whole life long. And I intend, intend to remain faithful. And husbands may say the same about their wives I will say congratulations keep it up <laughs> he may be young people they may say look I've never had anything to do with adultery this message is not for me listen please listen old or young or any age and never forget this you can have forgiveness for your biggest sin but you need forgiveness for your smallest sin to God it actually doesn't matter whether I'm a big sinner or whether I'm a small sinner some people say I didn't rob a bank I have killed nobody I'm a decent person I don't need this Jesus and his salvation. What? If you are the smallest of all sinners and you die without forgiveness of your sins, that small sin will still take you to hell. What I'm saying is this. Whether I have a million sins or if I, I only have 10 sins, big ones or only small ones, the truth is we all need Jesus. We cannot do without Jesus. We belong to the family of Adam and Eve, to fallen humanity. We all need Jesus and you need Jesus. Jesus as well. Say amen. 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 Hallelujah. 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 There's a, a couple of questions. I still have got a couple of questions I've got to deal with. Is that okay? Yes. One question is this. Some people say, Jesus didn't do the right thing there. Because if you believe it or not, it's also in your Bible written. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 20. That a man or a woman who commits adultery shall be, shall die. It says there, shall die. The word of God applied to Jesus as much as it applies to you and as it applies to me. And some people, they say, Jesus should have fulfilled Leviticus 20 verse 20 on the spot at that moment. Why didn't he do it? I've got fantastic news for you. Are you ready for it? Yes. I tell you why Jesus didn't pick up stones with his hands. Because he had said he had not come to condemn the world, but to save the world.
But the real reason is another one. I tell you why Jesus didn't pick up boulders with his hands to drop them on that woman, on me and on you. Because at that moment, that morning in Jerusalem, Jesus was already on his way to be executed on behalf of that woman. He sought to speak, took her death sentence from her, put it on himself and gave her eternal life. That is what salvation is. Forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord. Neither do I condemn you. The moment the heart of Jesus broke open like a fountain, the heart of that woman opened. And waves of love flowed from his heart to hers. What? For the first time in her life, she knew what love was. What she had called love before was nothing but rottenness and death. Now the love of God was life and peace and salvation and deliverance. That's what happened. You see, Jesus fulfilled Leviticus 20 verse 20 on himself. In the, that's what I always preach in Africa. When I preach to hundreds of thousands of Muslims. I tell them in the Christian faith nobody needs to die. Because somebody died for us. For us all. And his name is Jesus. Are you happy? Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is what we call the substitutionary death of Jesus. You see? Somebody died for me. Somebody died for you. But you've got to accept that gift from him. Whether you are a big sinner or small sinner, it doesn't matter one bit. You need salvation. You need Jesus here tonight. You need Jesus. We all need Jesus. We can't do without Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I've, I've got another question. You want to hear what's on my mind? The Bible says that they arrested that woman in the very act of adultery. Now a woman can do many things. But there's one thing a woman can never, never, ever do. She cannot commit adultery all by herself. So my question is, who was the man? Shall I tell you what my suspicion is? It was a Pharisee. Never trust a man in holy garments.
There are lots of hypocrites. Put your trust in Jesus. We put our trust in Jesus. And in Jesus alone. Hallelujah. Wow. I'm coming now to some big matters. The best is still to come, you know. These Pharisees, I can't get away from the Pharisees. Let me put it this way. The Pharisees made the mistake of their lives. When the Holy Spirit convicted them of their sin. That they picked up the holy garment. <laughs> put in the reverse gear. And gracefully disappeared. That's why we call them hypocrites. What? So close to the only savior between heaven and earth. Why putting in the reverse gear? Oh my God. If I had been there, I think I would have done it differently. Instead of putting in the reverse gear, I would have put in the first gear. Instead of running away, I would have run forward. I would have knelt next to that woman. Right next to her. I would have lifted my hands. I would have cried, Jesus. I did not commit adultery. It's true. But oh Jesus, I've got so many other sins. I need to be forgiven. Please, Jesus. As you accepted her. As you saved her, please save me as well. Andrew, I need you. See, that's now this is my personal assistant, Andrew Colby. You know, I feel such an anointing on me this very moment. And I'll tell you why. I feel as if God has drawn a circle around us all. Right in the middle, he is standing and that woman is kneeling. Outside of that circle are the Pharisees, the judges, and the jury accusing that woman of her sin. I want to say, all of us are guilty before God, even if you are a high court judge. If you want forgiveness of your sins, you've got to step forward, kneel where millions have knelt throughout time. Confess your sins to Jesus and receive eternal life. It is so easy to be a hypocrite. It is so easy to hear such a message and then walk out as if you are the brother of the Pope in Rome. 
Yet, Jesus is calling you. Jesus himself, the Son of God. And he says, come, kneel in this circle. I will save you as I saved her. Big sins or small sins. I can handle sins, Jesus would say. Because I shed my blood to cleanse from all sins. That is salvation. That is salvation. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Hallelujah. Please, don't retreat. But step forward and kneel at the feet of Jesus. I will give you an opportunity here in a moment. But I tell you, you must kneel at the feet of Jesus. Say, Lord, I am guilty. I need salvation. Please save me now. And he will do it. Ah, I must go back to the woman one more time. Is that okay? When those Pharisees grabbed that woman, they kicked her. There was no mercy. They kicked her against her will. It was never on the short list of that lady to attend a crusade meeting where Jesus was the preacher. She felt she had her religion. She needed no Jesus. But my God, those men wanted to kick that woman into the grave. They said, today you are going to die. You will be buried before the sun is set. And just by accident, they kicked that dear woman to the only one between heaven and earth who could have ever saved her. Give a shout of hallelujah. Hallelujah! I must make a confession here. And that is this. I'm an evangelist. Sometimes I feel like kicking. I just can't understand why some people do everything to stay away from this wonderful Jesus. The only one who can forgive them and who can give them eternal life. It is, it's Jesus. Sometimes I feel like kicking, but I won't kick. Because nobody is being kidnapped to heaven. Everyone has got to make a decision of himself. A decision of himself. No, I don't want to kick. But if I could, I would put my arm around your shoulder. I would say, my brother, my sister. Please, let me lead you to this wonderful Jesus who will forgive all your sins and break all your chains. He will break all your chains. It's a decision. It's a decision. You have heard the gospel here tonight crystal clear. There is no, there is no hole through which one can escape. We've got to face Jesus right now as a backslider. Backslider, my goodness. I want to say to every backslider 
Why must you always slide back from Jesus? Why can't you slide away from the devil? Slide away from the devil, slide to Jesus. He will give you eternal life. And he will give you a brand new life and a calling and fill you with the Holy Spirit. And maybe you will inherit my microphone. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. This is not my microphone. It belongs to Pastor Sergio. But oh, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come to Jesus. Come home. I said to a young man, I said, when are you going to get saved? He said to me, he said to me, ah, oh, he said, I'm only 20 years old. He said, in my country, men have a life expectancy of 80. I've got 60 years ahead of me. I have plenty of time for that when it comes to that. The moment the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I said, young man, you are totally wrong. And I will tell you why. The border to eternity is never ahead of us. The border to eternity always runs next to life. The border to eternity runs parallel to life. It's never ahead of us. And because it runs parallel to life, it can be stepped over by young or old any day. Here may be very educated people, but the, the most educated even with the whole alphabet behind his name, doesn't know if he is still alive tomorrow morning. That's why the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. And you need to step right into that circle and say, Lord, I don't want to be a hypocrite any longer. I want to receive salvation. And I want to receive it now, in Jesus' name. Close your eyes. Let us pray. Lord, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your wonderful presence. You are here. You have spoken to us. We look into your wonderful eyes. And you look into ours. Your arms are wide open. You are ready to save. Jesus, I want to thank you. And while all eyes are closed, I want to ask who is here this evening. Who has heard the voice of Jesus in your heart? And you want to kneel next to that woman, receiving salvation and forgiveness of your sins. Then I, it would be the greatest honor for me to lead you in this prayer of salvation to Jesus Christ. If you want to be saved, and kneel next to that woman and you want me to pray for you please lift your hand that I can see and pray for you just lift your hand let Jesus see your hand please let Jesus see your hand thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you Thank you, thank you. God bless you. Thank you. I see so many hands. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I'm asking everybody to stand, please. 
And those who have raised their hands to Jesus, or you should have raised your hand, I would ask you to come forward. I want to pray with you right here. Please come forward now in Jesus' name. Praise God. Come in Jesus' name. Come in Jesus' name. Come in Jesus' name. Come in Jesus' name.